Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous video, we got a new PDE to work on. That is the wave equation. So remember, it kind of looks like the heat equation, except for one major difference. Now you have both two derivatives in space and in time. Now what we're going to see when we start solving this is that that gives radically different solutions. And that makes sense, right? A vibrating string doesn't behave the same way that heat does. But what I would like to do before I get into actually solving this is in this brief lecture, I want to talk about boundary conditions of this thing. Now, the most natural boundary conditions that you could probably put on this thing are Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now, you know Dirichlet boundary conditions from uh, the heat equation. You know that this comes from fixing the values at both of the endpoints. What I would like to do, though, is I'd like to consider what this actually means in the case of the wave equation. Remember, with the heat equation, that meant that I fixed the temperature at the endpoints. But what does U describe now? U now describes vertical displacement of my string. So what this says is that there is no vertical displacement of the string at either of the ends. These are, these are pinned boundaries. And this describes your typical stringed instrument, right? If you think about, again, a guitar or even the piano strings, right? Or a violin or, or any sort of stringed instrument, we, we fasten them down at either end. And what you do is you pluck that string and you allow it to wiggle, but the ends of it are stuck. Dirichlet boundary conditions, at least for the application that we are talking about here for a vibrating string, are really the most sort of natural boundary conditions that one would put on this. Now, of course, you could also force the boundaries. So for example, you could take maybe that right endpoint and you could prescribe some sort of external forcing. So maybe instead of this being fastened down, what you have is you have some sort of periodic driving force, right? This would be, uh, I know that the example I'm gonna give you is in two dimensions, but it would be very similar to this. It would be like skipping rope, right? My hand would be a boundary, right? I'm the end of my jumping ropes uh, here, and I am doing a periodic motion, right? That would be an external forcing in time. And so what I'm doing is I am prescribing what happens to this string at the endpoints, right? A whole bunch of different things can be happening at it, along the string, but at the end of it, I am forcing it. If you wanted to do this in one dimension, you could just take your, your skipping rope or something like that, tie it to one end, that would give you a Dirichlet condition on one end, and then take it on, on the other end and just vibrate it up and down straight so that all of the motion is just in one dimension. That would give you some sort of forcing. If you do that periodically, this would maybe be a sinusoidal forcing. If you do it all crazy, maybe it's a more of a chaotic forcing. But the point is, whatever you're doing on the end is forcing what's happening to the string inside. I wanna give you another type of boundary condition here that really sort of blows things up and makes things uh, a little bit more interesting. And this is going to be coming from an application of mechanics, okay? So what this is called is a variable support, support boundary. Now we're gonna think about creating a, a crazy little mechanical system. And here's what I wanna do. I'm just gonna do this on one end. You can do this on two ends if you want it as well. But here's what I wanna do. I want, so here's my string. Let's say, you know, one end is, is doing whatever it wants at x equal to L, but on this end, it's attached to a mass, and that mass is on some sort of spring or some sort of mechanical system that causes it to move, okay? So let's say the height of the mass is Y of T, okay? So the height of the mass at time T is given by Y of T. This is a vertical displacement. And let's say whatever this sort of base of this mass is on, maybe it's jiggling around too, okay? So you could imagine that I have maybe the base here and I've got some sort of 
driving sinusoidal force. And it's causing the mass on the end of this spring to sort of spring up and down. But because the, the mass in, is attached to the string, that is also causing me to sort of vibrate the string here as well, okay? So it's a, it's a really sort of fun, kind of complicated uh, mechanical system that we can actually derive equations for. So let's imagine this is happening at x equal to zero. Uh, we don't, we're, for now, we're not gonna care about what happens at x equal to L. You can just put the, the spring on the other end, you could have two springs, you could have a fixed condition, whatever you want, all right? Um, and then in this case, well, the boundary condition here, well, the boundary condition would be this. U of 0 comma t is equal to y of t. Well, that's not really that surprising, right? The, the vertical displacement of my string at the left endpoint is just given by wherever the mass is pulling it. However, here's the problem. This is technically unknown, right? y of t is governed by its own ordinary differential equation. The question is, what is that ordinary differential equation? How do we derive it? Well, let's say let L equal to the length. Um, this is the length of the unstretched string, right? So if you've watched my other videos, um, uh, especially the one on mechanical systems, you'll, you'll know how to derive an ordinary differential equation for this spring mass system. But let's, uh, let's make some assumptions here. Okay, we're going to make the assumption that the spring obeys Hooke's law. Now, you might have to remember some of your physics, but essentially Hooke's law says that the more you stretch the spring, the more resistance that's going to be applied to this thing. And in particular, Hooke's law says that the force, that sort of force of resistance, is proportional to how long or how much that string is stretched. And here we're going to have constant, we're just going to call it k greater than zero, right? This is the sort of stretchiness of the spring, the spring constant. And we are also going to assume that this y of zero, the base movement, is prescribed. So the base movement, I call that y naught, is prescribed. Okay, so maybe if, I'm, if I built this in the lab or something like that, you know, I'm saying how this is moving. Okay, maybe that's some external uh, forcing I'm putting on this. Well, then the, the first thing that we can do is we could say that the length of the spring, the length of the spring is going to be the, the vertical height, y of t, minus where the base is, right? It's the distance from the vertical height down to the base. And this also means that the stretching of the spring. Well, the, the stretching of the spring is going to be the length of the spring minus its displacement from the original length of that spring. And so what this means with all of this information is that I can put Newton and Hook together. So again, if you've seen my other video on mechanical systems, to get the spring mass ordinary differential equation, you just put Newton and Hooke together. Both of them describe a force. You just set those two forces equal to each other. Newton gives you forces equal to mass times acceleration. Hooke gives you forces equal to constant K times the, the stretch of the string. So what this gives you is mass times acceleration is equal to the spring constant, negative K, uh, here the minus is, is because of the stretching, and then y of t, and then the length of the, the length of the stretch string here. So y minus y dot of t minus l. And that gives you whatever you want. You can also imagine other forces being applied on here. So maybe uh, the force due to gravity, but for now we're just going to ignore the other forces, okay? So one thing that, that you could also, you know, if you really want to make this super realistic, so you could you would also have the force of gravity if this is a very heavy mass, 
or you could imagine there's some sort of tensile force taking place here, uh, which would mean that you've got to go back to the previous video, you'd have some plus t of zero comma t sine of theta, zero, right? So you have these, these sort of really complicated expressions that could potentially be coming in. So let's actually look at that tensile force. So tensile force. So here, let's do plus tensile force. And let's take a look at what this would look like. Well, again, remember from the previous video, we assumed that the, the angle of displacement is very small. Again, think that guitar string. And so what this tells me is that my tensile force, again, just coming from the previous video, which we've already sort of looked at this thing. This is, again, this is at the end point. So this is at x equal to zero. This should be essentially uh, t of zero comma t times tan of theta zero comma t. Again, you might have to remind yourself in the previous video, but again, the tan, which we already saw, this is just the slope of the string. So this is the partial derivative with respect to x at zero, right? So it's a left boundary condition. And so essentially what this does is this gives you the following. So if we're gonna assume t is a constant, we'll call it t naught again, just like we made with the assumption to get the original uh, wave equation. But assuming that t is constant, this gives me, here's my equation. Okay, so second order differential equation in time, but let's take a look at this for a second. What is y of t? y of t is just u of zero comma t. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write this in terms of the unknown of the wave equation now. Get rid of all the y's. So you can see this is getting really complicated. And then zero comma t. And then this is equal to, okay, so minus k. And y of t, again, that's zero, uh, u of zero comma t minus the movement of the base minus the strength, the length of the string, and then plus a tensile force. Again, I'm just going to assume the tension is constant along the string. So T naught, just like we did in the previous video, U of zero, U of X, zero comma T. And if you really wanted to, you could put plus G or something like that, right? So, so plus some gravitational force in this thing. <clears throat> and so if you wanted to, you could assume that the mass is small enough that you can neglect gravity here. So there's not a whole lot of gravitational force. It's really the, the other two forces that are doing most of the work. And the important thing to notice here is what this equation actually becomes. So this is second order differential equation in time, first order in x so sorry these should actually be partials but this is a partial differential equation in its own right it's a really hard partial differential equation because look at this all depends on the movement of the string as well right so the the movement of the string is forcing the spring but the spring is forcing the movement of the string right so you get this sort of uh snake eating its own tail but here's the thing Let's assume the mass is super, super small, okay? So mass is much smaller than one. That's assuming like this is a really lightweight mass. Then essentially what that will do is that will allow me to neglect this time derivative, okay? This acceleration term because this is super small, okay? So I'm doing some sort of physics-y hand-waving here. But let's, let's rearrange now if this is equal to zero. Now I get this t naught partial in x uh, at the left boundary is equal to k and then u of zero comma t. And I'm just gonna write this, u e of t. e stands for external, okay? So in my case, this would be y naught minus, uh, plus l, but this could include gravity or whatever else we wanted to include. It just means an external force. Here's the thing, 
Go back to your notes and remind yourself of the boundary conditions for the heat equation. This is Newton's law of cooling, right? So it took me a long time to get there, but essentially you can see that you can apply a lot of the same boundary conditions that you had for the heat equation. They can be applied to this wave equation, this sort of string equation as well. You could also look at what's called a free boundary. What would a free boundary be? Well, a free boundary is your Neumann boundary conditions. This would be, again, if, you, if you're thinking about your uh, heat equation, this was an insulated boundary. So the question is, where would maybe a free boundary condition come from? Well, this would come from just allowing yourself to completely wiggle. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? You're not pinned down. You're just allowing yourself to wiggle in the same way that, that water would sort of splish and splash. Um, it kind of feels like we're getting into like almost string theory from physics, right? You have these sort of vibrating strings. But the real way that you can derive this free boundary condition is by imagining that your string or your your spring that this thing is uh, attached to well this would be letting k go to zero so if k is really really small so that means that my spring it's pretty stretchy essentially what the, is what that's telling me right so it's telling me that there's not a whole lot of force that's being applied as I stretch this thing out. So it's like a really kind of junky spring. You can imagine this thing sort of flopping all over like a jack in a box almost, right? But that would be one place where you get a free boundary. So take, take note, right? Dirichlet, we've used that before. Neumann, we've used that before. Um, Newton's law of cooling, essentially. Okay, we haven't used it yet, but it, we could still work with it. So the point is all of the same boundary conditions that we saw for the heat equation, they also apply to the wave equation as well. So with that being said, in the next video, we're going to solve the wave equation. So I'll see you all there.